Hello, it's Jen Taub. Welcome back to Booked Up, a podcast that features you, me, and our favorite authors. This week, my guest is my good friend, Heather McGee. Heather is an expert in economic and social policy. She is the former president of the inequality-focused think tank, Demos, and now chairs the board of Color of Change, the nation's largest online racial justice organization. I'll be talking today with Heather about the newly released Young Reader edition of her best-selling book, The Sum of Us. This book helps show how racism affects and harms all of us and how we need to face it head on together. If you like what you hear, please follow Booked Up on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen and tell your friends. Okay, let's dive in. Hi, Jen. Hey, Heather. How How are are you? you? Good. Good to see you. It's so nice to see you. You've got the whole... Real microphone set up over there, I see. Yeah, yeah. Now you do. do you, are you still on the East Coast, though? Or are you? Yeah, I'm in Brooklyn, yeah. So were you, why do I have this idea that at one, you must have been in D.C. at some yeah, point. Yeah, I no? lived in D.C. during Don Frank. Mm-hmm. And then you came up at, when you became executive director of Demos, you came mm-hmm. up to New York? Mm-hmm. Oh, that makes sense. Yeah, okay. but I had lived in New York before law school. Right, that makes sense. I was like, it's so funny because like, when I knew you, when we were on um, that uh, that working group mm-hmm. with AFR, mm-hmm. like I don't think I realized that you had been a Demos before. You know, it's like now I'm piecing together your biography, and I didn't. I mean, I think the only thing we talked about once about personal stuff is that you had been to Bement, and then you bring that <laughs> you bring yeah. up that you'd gone to boarding school as an 11 year old. That I'm still kind of trying to piece that together, how that felt, and you talk. Uh, a bit about that in the book, mm, but mm-hmm. now that you yeah. have a four-year-old, would you send him to the Mint? <laughs> no way. <laughs> <laughs> no way, no how. <laughs> That's so young, don't you think? It's so young. It's ridiculous. <laughs> um, my husband, Michael, went to boarding school when he was starting eighth grade, but he was young. He was 12. Yeah, that's the same. And it's too young. It's, I, I'm just, mm-hmm. yeah, I'm just, totally. but- you know, what, it, you know, I don't know. I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, listen, yeah, it, it's, it's, it's definitely not something I would do right now. My son's in public school in Brooklyn and I love that. I, you know, it was an amazing education mm-hmm. and I was really not well served by my public school education in Chicago before it. So, you know, no regrets, but. Yeah. Yeah. yeah no. <laughs> um, and, uh, I'm just, it's also like funny to um, be able to talk to you in, I guess, more of a relaxed context. I mean, I feel like whenever I'm running into you these days, it's like, I think the last time I saw you was maybe like in the hair and makeup room at 30 yeah, Rock. Yeah, and then before yeah. that at Tax March, I yeah. mean, you know, <laughs> is your, but and you, now, you've, go ahead. Yeah, I, yeah, right now I just like, you know, had to work out with my personal trainer. I'm sitting here with <laughs> In my living room, so I'm I'm much more relaxed. Um, Oh, that's good. I'm so, I've been so, it's been so wonderful to watch you, um, you know, have more of a public role and a commentator and everything. So I I think it's really great. And then, so what's your vision with the podcast? Yeah, I I think my vision is kind of what we're doing now, which is people who I know who've written books, that I get to talk to them about mm-hmm. the writing process, how their mm-hmm. life is going and, and and what they're what they're writing about. And and because it's only nonfiction, mm-hmm. there's already, you know, any kind right. of nonfiction book, there's gonna be some polemic or something mm-hmm. if it's a memoir. And I just I think that we lost I think we lost the ability to kind of talk to each other during the Trump era or maybe even the Dodd Frank era. I feel like this whole this past, I don't know, twelve, thirteen, fifteen years has so been in, intensely like walking around and speaking like a white paper. Like I'm speaking, <laughs> trying to persuade someone or to, trying to change the law. And just, you know, it, it, and then I think with COVID, yeah, um, we weren't seeing each other face to face and we started mm-hmm. doing these Zoom things. But I don't know. I just think I want to start having conversations with people mm-hmm. um, and valuing the good that we do not just, uh, you know, marking off the victories, I guess. That's yeah. my goal. Okay, I great. That, I don't know if that's a valid goal. Yeah, that, that's um, great. And so I'm, 
like the timing, I, I'm just I'm just stunned because, um, well, a true confession. Of course, I always buy my friends books. And so when um, in 2021, <laughs> it's a good habit. Better to buy and read later than to, yeah. you know, say I'm not buying it. So I bought so I bought the some of us and you made the rounds and got all um, well-deserved attention. And I finally just read it, though. Oh, reading okay. it. Yeah. Okay. So I know it's terrible. I bought, no, 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 it's fine. It's fine. <laughs> But I am like, I guess I've got a, 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 a few observations to just make sure I get to ask you about, which is first, what is it like taking this really important book that asks us to confront white supremacy and to recognize that if we work in solidarity with each other, we can find this kind of dividend that together we're, you know, and especially, let me just point out the, you know, kind of rewriting or re-understanding the narrative about what's going on here, how much white people are losing by being so isolated, mm-hmm. right? So there's that, and this is a really important topic. And yet you are coming out like right now with the um, young reader version of this no. in an era when Florida has a governor and Arkansas has a governor, I don't know how she became governor, um, who are banning books. Yeah. So is your book going to be at the top of the banned book list? I'm just curious <laughs> how you feel about that. Yeah. Well, thanks, Jen. I I don't think it's going to be at the top of the list. I think the 1619 Project is at the top of the list, right? Um, uh-huh. al- also a book Good by Good for my, Nicole Hannah-Jones. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> also a book by my editor, um, One World and Chris Jackson. Um, and, you know, I think the targeting of these books, however, and of these ideas and of these conversations, uh, the targeting of our children's freedom to learn is quintessential drained pool politics, which is what I talk about in The Sum of Us. It's a narrow, self-interested elite that, by the way, is highly educated in elite liberal schools and then wants none of that education uh, for the masses. Um, who are using a zero-sum story saying it's, you know, either Black history or American history. Um, you know, it's either, you know, racial justice or your children's, you know, fragile psyches uh, in order to factionalize white parents against an integrated public good, mm-hmm. right? In order to say that public schools can't be trusted because they are going to pollute your white children's minds with integrated ideas um, that and and therefore you should turn away from them, you should attack them, you should throw them into chaos, etc. And they're trying so hard these book bans by um, attacking the kinds of history and information and stories that we know bring out feelings of empathy and solidarity mm-hmm. and wonder. Um, they're trying to make the most diverse generation in American history as divided as their generation. Um, and so in some ways, uh, what's going on right now with all these attacks on our children's freedom to learn, um, this robbing us of our shared history is sort of, the new object lesson of Mm -hmm. the sum of us. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Um, But I hope that the book is not at the top of the banned book list, obviously, for um, reasons that I want it to not just be read in Brooklyn and Los Angeles. I want it to be read by people across the country and young people who have asked themselves, what's going on? Why is our society so divided divided and dysfunctional? And is there a better way? Does it have to be us versus them? And the real message of The Sum of Us is that it doesn't have to be us versus them, and we all stand to benefit from racial equity. I want you to um, talk a little bit about the, the phrase you just used, drained pool politics, a metaphor and a reality, and also makes up the, the cover art uh, for the book. Yeah. Um, what do you mean by that? So the, the central metaphor at the heart of The Sum of Us is the story of what happened to many of the nearly 2,000 lavishly funded grand resort-style public swimming pools that were part of a building boom of public goods in the New Deal era. In the 1930s and 40s, you had public roads and bridges, schools, libraries, parks, and pools. And these pools were not 
the kind of pools that maybe you and I might think of when we think of a community pool. These could hold thousands of swimmers at a time. Mm. They were like this glittering monument to a deeper ethos that was really born out of the excesses of the first Gilded Age of inequality, um, born out of obviously the crucible of the Great Depression. And this public goods ethos said, yeah, government has a right and a responsibility to ensure a decent standard of living for our people. When were those and, built again? I mean, these thousands of pools? Yeah, it was during the WPA New Deal oh, era. okay. Right? So, so like in the 40s. Yeah, yeah in, the, in the 30s and 40s. Uh-huh. Um, and, you know, for me, obviously, as someone who with a background in economic policy, when I think of the New Deal public goods, I think of economic goods like Social Security and the massive investment in uh, developing housing and the creation of the um, government-backed mortgage and the GI Bill and free college and all those things that were really the foundations of the middle class. And what was the big aha and sort of connection for me was that like so many of but that both the public swimming pools and those economic public goods were um, either explicitly or just by um, sort of custom and enforced through intimidation and violence in terms of the pools Mm -hmm. or in implementation in terms of the policies. Um, They were for whites only Mm -hmm. and segregated, right? So you had Social Security, which excluded the two categories of workers that Black workers were mostly in, right? Domestic work and agricultural work. Um, We had, of course, we know the explicit racism that defined the housing market, the progressive New Deal, FDR, federal government, you know, drawing maps of the whole country and saying these are the Negro areas, do not lend. Um, You know, but even the GI Bill, which was race neutral on its face, right, those benefits are in housing and education, two highly segregated sectors, right? And so for me, making the connection that the segregated public swimming pools, which were, you know, fiercely fiercely segregated, right? There was something about the ideology of the lie of white supremacy that said there was something so wrong with the black body that to share water with it would be to contaminate, right? Mm. There's also, of course, the valence of, you know, the fear of miscegenation. Right. Right. So, you know, we can't have teenagers, you know, in various levels of undress uh, gazing because at each other. Because they might start dating each other. God exactly, forbid. Yeah. exactly. Um, so the public swimming pools were, were fiercely segregated. And so in, when I, as a writer, realized that I could make this connection between the segregated public pools of the first half of the 20th century and the segregated public goods of the first half of the 20th century, there was a, a real aha moment for me because what happened with the pools in our legal history is that Black families and their allies sued all across the country to integrate public pools. And when they won in the late 1950s and early 60s, many towns and cities decided to drain their public pools rather Mm. than integrate them. Mm. Right, So they literally drained out the water, backed up truckloads of dirt and gravel, and that happened all over the country. It happened in Montgomery, Alabama. It happened in uh, Warren, Ohio. It happened in West Virginia. It happened in New Jersey and Washington State, right? Um, and can you imagine and, that? I mean, can you imagine yeah. being a child? And I'm not. I'm now trying to like think through all the children, right? The lens depending on who you are. Like, if you're a white child watching the adults do this, and like, what's your reaction? Is it like? angry at the adults, the white adults for taking, for like being such idiots and so racist? Or are you angry at um, the black kids and parents because if they hadn't sued, you would have your pool? Mm -hmm. And if you're a black kid, what are you internalizing? I I can't imagine. Do do you know, have you, do you know what, have you looked at any of? Well, I think all of those um, reactions, I've heard people who lived through that time Mm -hmm. that I've interviewed and come across in my Um, travels around the country for the book have expressed. The main thing was a resentment, Mm. right? Because, you know, if you've been told, in fact, by the government for your whole life and in all of American history that there's something so wrong with Black people that you shouldn't even share water with them. And then all of a sudden that same government flips and says, no, actually, we should desegregate. 
And instead of be- being the enforcer of the racial hierarchy is the upender of it. Mm-hmm. And the cost of that is that you as a white family lose out on something that was free and public and good. If you're rich enough, you can build a backyard swimming pool. If you're rich enough, you can join one of the paid membership-only private swim clubs that cropped up all over the country Mm -hmm. in the wake of pool desegregation. But what was once a public good became a private luxury. And so, you know, if you're already wired to distrust, disdain, resent Black people, then of course, right, the but-for cause of the destruction of these public goods was the demands by Black people to be included in them. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, that's happening in, uh, you know, as families are are looking at the trucks backing up the gravel into the Oak Park pool in in Montgomery, Alabama. But of course, it's also happening broadly politically in the 1960s as white people who had been raised to see the role of government as sort of this benevolent, um, often invisible kind of foundation, right? You just sort of take for granted that the pool will be there and that it'll be lovely and well-maintained. You take for granted that there will be ample housing for you to buy into and you can afford it on one salary, right? You take for granted that there's social security, right? All of these things, that there are great jobs and you're the only ones who get to apply for them. (laughs) You know, all of this, that's just sort of like, well, yeah, this is just the way that it works. This is the expectation. And all the segregation and all the sort of internalized racism where it doesn't dawn on you that there's a whole group of people being excluded from these public, so-called public goods. Look, oh, I, I think th- I think white people were very aware of segregation. They just believed that there was something wrong was with black people. Right. Yeah. But I mean, today, people look like today, um, you know, people, I'm teaching a course just to, called Money, Law, and Power, this semester. Mm-hmm. And the first book we're reading is Mirsa Baradaran's um, Color of Money, about uh-huh. black banking and the Freedmen's Banking. Obviously, you know about that because you you in, you include that in your book. But there's a way in which that I find some of the students I'm teaching, um, and we have a, we have a, a very um, diverse student body, but in this particular class, not so much. It's mostly, it's a smaller class and it's mostly white students being surprised, like not realizing that the Homestead Act or the home, you know, the Hulk after the uh, Great Depression, or the GI Bill, mm-hmm. um, not realizing that these were s- segregated opportunities. Oh, absolutely. I mean, listen, Jen. Less than ten percent of high school seniors in 2018 could accurately name slavery as the primary cause for the Civil War. So I am not surprised that your oh. students don't know, you know, about redlining maps in the Homeowners Loan Corporation. <laughs> you know? Well, it's not like they taught that at my school. I exactly. mean, like you. Or mine, frankly, or mine. <laughs> I mean, or I went mine. to an elite private school and I didn't know, and this it comes up in your book and it comes up in, I don't know if you know Steve Phillips's book, How to Win the Civil War. Uh-huh, you know him? Uh-huh. Yeah, he, yeah, I do. I, I just had him uh, um, uh, on the show. And uh, yeah, one thing I learned from both of your books, and I told my students I hadn't known this, and I don't know why. It's about, it's related. It's about the assassination of Abraham Lincoln. And we've all learned about John Wilkes oh. Booth, right? And you just think about, oh, you look, when I was a kid, I think the way it was taught was like, he just showed up and was angry at Lincoln and shot him at a play. <laughs> That's it. Yeah, like, we just, know everything about the play. Yeah. Right. Uh, um, my cousin or something, or I don't know. Yeah. Anyway, so he said, <laughs> whatever. But I find out, and I'm not going to quote him, um, the language of it, but I find out that it was just, first of all, timing-wise, Lincoln's assassinated five days after the end of the war, the surrender. Also, three days after John Wilkes Booth, uh, here's his speech in which he says, and the next step we're going to be doing is allowing Uh, Black Americans to vote. That's Lincoln's Mm -hmm. plan for reconstruction. Mm -hmm. And that's not going to happen. And he literally says this is the last speech he's going to give and then goes out and kills him a few days later. Why don't we know that? Yeah. It's really important. And this, I'm going to get you back to the pool metaphor. Um, But until we understand how much white America historically and into the present, resisted having either the franchise or public goods really accessible to all. Until we understand that, 
I don't think we can, we can move forward. And it seems, Mm -hmm. how come we weren't taught, were you Mm -hmm. taught that about John Wilkes Booth? No, I definitely wasn't. I learned that um, from one of my colleagues at Demos, um, Brenda Wright, who was a long time, you know, democracy, is a long time democracy scholar and, 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 and litigator. Um, and she knew that and told me that quote, right? So I didn't know that until it was my job to know about race and democracy. Um, but, you know, of course, you know, you ask the question, why, Jen? And it's a really good one because, um, you know, I tell the story in the afterward of the paperback uh, and in the Young Readers book of a, a, a mom that I talked to, a white suburban mom, um, who very much identifies that way. I'm not pigeonholing her, um, named Rachel, who lived in Oklahoma her whole life uh, and was educated in Oklahoma schools um, and did not know about the 1921 Tulsa race massacre mm-hmm. until recently. Mm-hmm. And she was just aghast. She was mortified. She was outraged. And she connected it. She said, you know, I remember as a kid, you know, driving through a Black neighborhood in Tulsa and asking my dad why that neighborhood was so poor, right? It was visibly poor. And the dad didn't really say much in response. And so she, of course, begins to associate Black people with poverty. And, you know, our narratives, our belief system is that you know, things happen because of what people do. That anyone brings their current state on themselves. Exactly. And, and anyone so who has a good know, state, yeah, if, you, if you're successful, it. you didn't have any government help. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And if you, if it, because Rachel didn't know that a thriving Black Wall Street was literally firebombed in a mm. conspiracy, and mm. then 50 years later when that neighborhood was rebuilt by those Black middle-class families, it was raised uh, for uh, an, a highway construction, right? That black wealth was was stolen time and yep. time again. Now it makes sense, right? And so what I try to do in The Sum of Us and why I'm so excited for young readers to have it is that it helps answer a whole bunch of the real head scratchers about American society, both why we can't have nice things, why we don't have beautiful thousand plus person public swimming pools everywhere, why we don't have kind of an update of the New Deal social contract, why why that didn't keep expanding and why it in fact contracted in the wake of the civil rights movement. And then of course, why things are the way they are. Why it is that today a black college graduate has less wealth than a white high school dropout, right? It makes no sense with our individualized narrative that just says, well, the black college graduate, you know, should go to college, check. Should get a good job, check. You know, black college graduates got higher income, right? A better paying job than a white high school dropout. But what that college grad couldn't do was go back in time and make sure that her grandparents were legally allowed to buy a home that Mm -hmm. would create an intergenerational wealth. And so, that's why the economic racial history is so important. And, and I hope, Jen, we can talk about the financial crisis chapter yes. because nobody yes. else ever wants to talk <laughs> about it. I do. Um, okay, so I'll move from draining and, ref- and, and refilling the pool, but I, I do love that metaphor because it makes you think about everything from, you know, when you talk about who wants to cut Social Security. Mm-hmm. It's the same thing. Social Security is a pool. Mm-hmm. And as soon as we let everybody into the pool, suddenly it's like, oh, let's let's shut that down and let people do it privately. Like it yeah. is, it, it's also, it's also familiar, but. Yeah. So but, the white, the white elderly and baby boom generation have social security secure, no problem. And then there's all this panic about how more diverse younger generations um, could, you know, wh- it becomes not a given that social security should stay. Um, in the book, I, I call all out drain pool politics and the story of how we went from free college to a debt for diploma system and nearly $2 trillion in student loan debt, drain pool politics around healthcare, et cetera. I think one entry point, because you know we can totally geek out on um, the financial crisis chapter, and I want to be careful before we get to that to start with the people. So maybe um, I just want to share with you how much I loved so many of the people that you met and introduced us to, um, including Janice and Isaiah. But before I get to them, what I do know is I have complete trust in your ability to observe people, pick up their humanity, their quirks, and their way of being, because there are some people I know in this book. (laughs) And I was stunned. Like, I love our friend Lisa Donner. Yeah. Um, 
uh, who who heads up Americans for Financial Reform. You describe her laugh in this book, and I and I was like, that is Lisa. It's, <laughs> it, that is, it's just it's so perfect. Um, yeah. and, and there's just so much and um, that you do and. I really enjoy that. I also enjoy, again, before we get to Janice and Isaiah, I really enjoy that you put yourself in this. And I always think of you as such like a, um, you know, because you led our led our task force or our, our working group, you're always very much on task. What are we doing next? What's the next step? Thinking things through. And I, I'm not saying that you don't have humanity, but I haven't known you as <laughs> like a human. You're laughing. And um <laughs> Well, you know, you got to be, you know, how we present ourselves in yeah. um, when we're working, when we're doing work as opposed to a friendship. And there's this moment that you describe in one of the chapters about the financial crisis, about it's like probably a year before things really hit the fan. I think it might have been 2007. It was, yeah. In Cleveland. Mm-hmm. Can you can you talk about about this? Because I, I, there's a moment where you are, something happens, you hear something and you go outside I think you're nauseous and you literally fall to your knees. And I felt that. I've had those moments. Can you talk about that? So, uh, you know, obviously you and I met in 2000 and late 2009, early 2010, Mm -hmm. when um, the House and Senate were considering the financial reform bill in the wake of the financial crisis. And, And we had this amazing coalition called Americans for Financial Reform. And when I was the Washington director of Demos, it was my job to staff the coalition and and honestly not because of any previous expertise in systemic risk and resolution authority of major financial institutions, but rather because I, you know, um, I did have a lot of background in consumer financial regulation and I was just willing to learn and ask the right questions. And my main job as the head of this task force was to have this amazing group of academics who were way in the weeds on these issues and be in constant touch with them and translate their knowledge to the Hill and do the boots on the ground lobbying and work on the legislative text and all of that together. And so we really were in the trenches together um, to make Dodd-Frank as strong as it possibly could have been against unbelievable, overwhelming odds um, with financial industry opposition. Can I interject how I <laughs> met you? My friend Jerry Epstein, the, the real geniuses, the uh, the economists that I knew because I was teaching at UMass at the time, I had been working with them because um, I'd written a paper in the fall of 2009. They were amazing. And they invited me to come down to Washington and wanted to introduce me to your group. And I said to my husband, Michael, at the time, really? If I'm the best they can do, we're in a lot of trouble. <laughs> and we and- were. <laughs> Because everybody who knew anything about the financial industry was on their payroll. <laughs> right. But but actually, I had worked at Fidelity Investments. Um, yeah. And so I knew something about um, short-term wholesale funding markets and securitization. But I'll tell you, it was great to learn on the job. But continue. You can continue. Before you and I met in the run-up to the peak of the subprime mortgage crisis, my job put me in a lot of places around the country where there were victims of predatory mortgage lending. And one of them was Cleveland, this neighborhood called Mount Pleasant, which is this beautiful, you know, tree-lined neighborhood of single-family homes and little duplexes. And um, it was just absolutely devastated by predatory mortgages. And Mm -hmm. it had created this conflagration of foreclosures. And it was a historically black neighborhood and just the, the scale of the theft and, and, and just, walking just around. And just to say this, let me just say, when you say predatory mortgages, these were not mortgage mortgage loans where people were borrowing money from a bank to, to buy the house, but they were financing most of these, right? They're existing mortgages. Yeah. Okay. Really the two big misconceptions both then and now about the financial crisis was that it was borrowers who sort of shouldn't have been able to afford houses anyway, um, when in fact the vast majority of these subprime loans, subprime meaning for people with less than prime scores, and that was a justification for them being far more expensive. These more expensive loans, the vast majority went to people who were already homeowners, right? They'd already done it. They'd already won in the, the game of the American dream. They had already s- saved and scrimped. Uh, and for the devastatingly... Uh, uh, overwhelmingly 
targeted Black and Brown communities, they had done so against tremendous odds. Mm -hmm. They were already homeowners. These were refinance loans uh, that stripped wealth. And, of course, the other big misunderstanding was that the the impression was that these were risky borrowers. And so there was sort of nothing else. They could never get a prime loan. And therefore, it was okay for the industry to price them for the risk that of de- default and foreclosure uh, by charging them so much more. But a huge Wall Street Journal study at the peak of the financial crisis showed um, that for most of the subprime boom, uh, the majority of subprime borrowers could have qualified for prime loans and black families. So those would have been lower interest rates, smaller payments, none of these exploding, you know, suddenly interest only exploding payments. They would have been standard. Yep. Okay. The the plain vanilla mortgages, as we call them, um, unironically, that had had created. I know. I just, as soon as you said that, I'm like, wow, that's the first time I just thought that. Yeah. Um, Right. The plain vanilla mortgages that created the sustainable home ownership for uh, you know, 50 years, um, once redlining nominally became not the practice of the federal government and, and banks, we had this flood of credit that was um, chocolate mortgages, right? That was strawberry mortgages that were really these exotic mortgages with strange new terms, and they were aggressively marketed first to the communities that were least protected and least respected. Mm-hmm. Um, and the majority of them, as I said, um, Uh, were people who could have qualified for cheaper, more affordable loans. And if you were Black, you were three times as likely to get a subprime loan controlling for everything else as a white family with a similar credit profile and everything. And so this is just racism, plain and simple, institutional racism. We saw the structural racism uh, with the way in which, you know, there were Black families concentrated to begin with, the way in which most of the white power structure used this old narrative that equated Black people with risk, which is, of course, the narrative that the red li- the original mm-hmm. redlining maps, right? right? The original exclusion from the home ownership uh, uh, free stuff w- was created on that basis. And so people looked the other way for far too long. And so while people were looking the other way, um, a lot of consumer advocates and, and trial lawyers and, and social justice folks were were really looking right at the problem. And that's what I was doing in Cleveland that day. And it was just devastating. Um, And I did, I I sort of excused myself from the group and ran around the corner so that they couldn't see me. And I just fell to my knees on the lawn and I just felt physically ill and overwhelmed. Yeah, I just just want to talk about the wealth. I'm cutting you off from feeling physically ill because I'm starting to feel that way maybe. And I just um, just want to make sure that, you know, we... uh, all kind of get, you know, the folks listening, what you mean by wealth stripping. In other words, there was, it was all these, this, there was a big refinancing trend before this happened. You know, interest rates kept going down and down in the early 2000s. And people would, uh, mortgage brokers aggressively went out to people and said, hey, do you want to refinance your mortgage? Your monthly payment's going to go down because the interest rate will go down. And you can take a little money out of the house. So if you owe $100,000, now maybe you're going to owe one hundred and twenty, dollars but your monthly payment's going to be the same, so no big deal. Um, and that all works fine as long as pri- housing prices were going up and interest rates were going down. And then something happened. I think it's like summer of 2003, Alan Greenspan starts raising interest rates. And now all these mortgage brokers and banks who were, bu- who were making money on the fees, you get paid a fee when you, you know, everyone gets paid a little bit of a fee or a big fee when they originate these mortgages. They're like, well, um, we'll have to come up with different kinds of mortgages because people aren't going to want to refinance into a higher rate, which is what they were doing. So they came up with these different ways to say, well, you're going to have a lower rate, but it was only temporary. These sort of variable rate um adjustable rate mortgages where it looked like your monthly payment was lower, even though you were borrowing more to pay back the old loan. And this is the thing that made me so sick that you were writing about, Heather, is these mortgage brokers who were taking these giant secret fees Mm -hmm. out. And people wouldn't, you know, you don't always notice the paperwork and what you owe. Most people look at you, what is the monthly payment going to be and didn't realize that it was going to jump up in two to three years. I mean, they're even more... Yeah. And they didn't realize also because, you know, tons of depositions show 
the mortgage brokers and the lenders were hiding it from them. Yes. Right. I mean, it wasn't just like, oh, buyer beware, you know, I just didn't do the homework, which is, you know, frankly, something that like top Democrats still say. Um, Mm -hmm. And there was real, real mendacity, right? Real fraud um, where the, the kitty was so big, what you could earn as a broker for closing loans, what you could earn, what the bank and the lending, the non-bank mortgage companies could earn if you, and I go through the math in one of the pages Mm -hmm. in the chapter, it's like, if you sell someone a 5% interest rate versus a 9% interest rate, like that is basically a doubling of the amount of interest that you you are going to collect from that person. And if you don't disclose the, you know, the fees, the points, if you hide the way that the uh, loan is going to explode, if you hide the balloon payment, mm-hmm. you're making someone who owns a home, you're giving them, you're taking that home from them, right? And that's what ended yes. up happening, right? So we saw the home ownership rate plummet among uh, Black families in a way that still hasn't recovered uh, and let and me just say, you know, you said that like one of the myths here too, you know, we keep saying, well, you know, and I even use the language that people didn't notice. These were, they were tricked and this wasn't, you know, it's, it's, it's so easy. It's the canary in the coal mine situation where if you target the most vulnerable communities who no one's going to listen to, you know, cause the people on yeah. the ground, the housing advocates were talking about this years yeah. before in the they 90s. were concerned. Mm-hmm. They went to the fed and complained and everyone said, Oh, this is anecdotal. And they ignored it. And, um, you know, you saw the numbers are, are are huge, the trillions of dollars that were being made off these higher interest loans. But then the people, these mortgage brokers, it's the difference between making five hundred or two thousand yeah. dollars. You know, and people, it, it, you know, you ma- you ma- do the math. People were getting people who were mortgage brokers were getting wealthy and thought this is great, and and, and it was really in some cases, you know, hugely. Deceptive, and by the way, this wasn't just rogue mortgage brokers. In in my book, um, other people's houses, I show yeah. evidence from Washington Mutual where they're saying they actually showed the board of directors, a committee of the board of directors, a, like a slide saying, you know, we're going to start introducing. They call them high risk mortgages because mm-hmm. they were designed to to make people default. And we're going to say, you know, in two years, like they were doing this, and they're like, hey, this is early two thousand four. They're like two thousand six. On this chart, this date, this is when everything's going to, you know, fall apart. And they were right. And it was this thing you talk about, IBG, YBG, the I'll be gone, you'll be gone, that everybody's like, well, this is a mess, but I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to just keep participating because I make, I make money. So and much like, what, money. Yeah. And, and let me just say that. And because I that, fundamentally don't value the people don't value on the other the end. Home. Right. It's a home. It's not a, a, a piece of collateral. Mm-hmm. And what they would, there, there were people in, um, for anyone who actually was told or understood, well, wait a second, what's going to happen to my payment in two years? What the mortgage brokers were trained to tell them is, yeah, in two years, it's true. You're going to go from paying something to like, you know, $1,000 to $3,000. And I know that's more than you can afford each month, but don't worry because your home is worth a lot Mm -hmm. and you can just sell it. Mm -hmm. And I know that this is what they were trained to say, but the problem is, housing prices collapsed Mm -hmm. because the refinances, everyone got appraisers who were in on the take saying your house was worth much more. Anyway, this whole thing was built to make a lot of people a lot of money. It was a hot potato of risk. And at the end of the day, the people who were going to lose were the five plus million Americans who lost their home to foreclosure. And this brings me to this lovely Mm -hmm. couple, Janice and Isaiah, who are kind of a miracle story. Mm -hmm. You want to tell me, (laughs) remind me of them? Because I just love them. So, um, I actually found Janice and Isaiah through Lisa Donner's husband, Mike Calhoun. Um, They're a Black couple who bought their first home a year after getting married in Wilmington, North Carolina, in a neighborhood where they were the only Black people. But that soon changed, as so often happens, as white folks moved out uh, in white flight. Um, And they were just sort of like a classic case of what happened where a black equity rich neighborhood was marketed aggressively like phone calls and phone calls saying do you you know need a little extra cash um do you uh you know do you need to make home repairs 
you know, come into our office and find about, out about ways to lower your payments and, and get money out, right? Mm-hmm. And so Janice went, and she went in, and she um, managed to bit be completely deceived by these people, Chase Mortgage Brokers, as they called themselves. And they sold her an extraordinarily expensive refinance loan with tons of fees. And by the grace of God, she ended up, she and her husband, Isaiah, ended up meeting a uh, a trial lawyer, a lawyer who was helping um, her husband with something else, Isaiah, with something else. And they brought in their paperwork, and he was aghast. And he was like, "This is this this violates all kinds of fiduciary duties, all kinds of fair lending laws in our what state." What brought them to the point to go to the lawyer? Were they struggling at that point? No, they really oh. weren't. I mean, that's oh. what's amazing. I, I think that um, Isaiah was always very suspicious of the loan. I see. And he was describing it. He was suspicious of it, mm-hmm. um, but it wasn't. They had never missed a payment. Right. Mm-hmm. It wasn't like they were going, um, they were getting behind at all. But he happened to hear about, um, but the lawyer, Mal, happened to, you know, they happened to mention some of the kind of aspects of the loan. And he said, you know, could you bring your paperwork in? Mm-hmm. And they ended up being the named plaintiffs of a class action lawsuit to go after these Brokers, quote unquote, who actually weren't brokers. Brokers are people who help you find, you know, shop around for a mortgage. Um, these were people who had an illegal kickback scheme with just one non-bank lender called Emergent. And, um, you know, I, I don't want to give it away, but there are just some some beautiful stories that Janice tells about her experience going to court to try to defend, you know, her home as well as the home of, you know, mm. over a thousand other black, white, and brown people in North Carolina who were targeted by this um, by this lender. And, and without it, she would have eventually lost the home, right? There was so much sort of cascading mm-hmm. fees and points uh, and interest rate um, nonsense that she would not, they would not have been able to keep their home uh, on their, you know, he was a mechanic, she was a school teacher. Do they make it into the um, new edition of the book? Yes, they stay in the Young Reader's Book. You know, it's interesting. Oh, good. The Young Reader's Book is um, is really just a shorter version of the adult book. Um, what I've learned is that, you know, young people are just like us. <laughs> um, and, um, you know, they don't need you know, sing song and, and, and anything different. Um, but it's just shorter and more manageable, right? So the mm-hmm. adult book is um, 400 pages long, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, almost 400. Uh, and the young adult book is just about 200 with bigger oh. font. Um, but I really wanted, as the editors did their first pass, Jen, you know, in some ways, some of the easiest thing, the easiest things to take out were the stories, right? Because it's like, well, you make your point through the data and the argument and the history, and then you add this sort of illustrative story of this family or of these workers. And so my, the first pass took out a lot of the stories. And I was like, oh, no, you don't. <laughs> because these people, I think, are so important. And it's the stories yes. that stick with people, with the reader. You can always look up the statistics, but the stories are right in your heart. Mm-hmm. And so I won't tell, I won't say too much, but I'll just say she she moved me. She obviously moved a judge um, that she spoke to. And she was, you know, she's sort of, to some degree, the kind of the spiritual center of the book, um, which kind of brings me to something that struck me and, and I mm. found um, incredibly moving, which is you talk about your own spirituality and, um, I was brought up, um, I was brought up and I still consider myself Jewish. And there was something that you said about the Jewish tradition um, that I hadn't really thought that much about that clicked in for me and Mm. completely um, changed my perspective on the divine. And I wanted to thank you about that um, as you're looking at me. (laughs) Yeah, it's, um, I think it's on like page 253. Wait, hold on. You're having this, um, you're talking with different, um, I guess, spiritual leaders. And there was, um, in particular, one rabbi. Mm-hmm. Um, 
And I think there was this this comment about. Um, yeah, I, I'm gonna. Yeah, find it. I think it's two fifty. It's two fifty in the paperback. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So two forty nine, two fifty, and and it's this idea about. Um, uh, you know, in the, this part, I understood that in a Jewish tradition, it's our obligation to kind of repair the world. Um, but that she talks about the, um, let me just read this. Rabbi Soul made the religious case that racism cuts both ways. Um, quote, racism actually has a dehumanizing aspect, not only for those who experience racism, but also for those who perpetuate it. Jewish tradition articulates that everyone is stamped in the image of God. Um, that's the end of the quote. And in some Jewish traditions, she said, quote, and this is the part, there's a notion that God is not a hierarchical God, but that God is the oneness of all of us. There's no difference between me and God. It's all the same. Um, and so racism is another way that divides that divine connection. Okay, so that completely blew me away. And I wish people could see right now, there is sunlight coming through the window <laughs> as we're talking, bathing you in this gorgeous light. Um, so I didn't plan that. Did you know this would be the time of day? Not enough. Um, but this really, you know, it kind of reminds me of the MLK and our, you know, the weaving our interconnectedness. Mm -hmm. um, but then you talk about your spirituality. Can you tell me how that, you know, this was a this moment that I found was so nice that you shared in the book. How does your spirituality affect your um, policy work in this book? So I'll, well, I'll just, I'll read it. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, I said, uh, I believe in a divine force to which we're all connected. And I admire the rituals and community building that organized religion offers, but I didn't grow up as a churchgoer. My mother, a deeply spiritual woman and a feminist, could never really accept a religion that figured the divine creator as male. <laughs> Yet I realized that I pursue my professional calling not only to improve our economy, but also out of a belief in the unseen, a promised land of a caring, just society. Across all my conversations for this book, I heard a unified yearning for a society like that. And racism destroys every path to that promised land for all of us. That is so beautiful. Oh, thank you. I mean, I oh. think that... Um, I think that we know, right? I mean, we know. You know, there's something profoundly um, just very deep within us that knows that something's wrong with our society, with so much mm -hmm. inequality, mm -hmm. the dehumanization of people because they have no money and because of the color of their skin and, you know, the targeting of vulnerable people um, by the most powerful. Like, we know that that's wrong. Mm -hmm. And what I hope is that the sum of us and the stories that I tell that really show how these things are all really connected by the same thread, by the same vein of, of zero-sum thinking and racism and our politics and our policymaking that says progress for people of color has to come at white folks' expense and that it's us versus them, you know, it, it can help sort of shore up the sense that it doesn't have to be this way. Mm -hmm. which I think is a very intuitively held sense among people, really, of, of lots of different kind of ideological stripes. Um, we just happen to be living right now at a time where the white supremacist tropes and the us versus them thinking is so core to the political and economic strategy of the right-wing elite um, that it's 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 a scary time, and it's. Um, but I I'm fundamentally a hopeful person, and every time I go out into the country and talk to people, um, I become more hopeful. The it's funny I'm waiting till now as we start to wind things up to talk about the most important contribution of your book, which is this concept that you describe as the solidarity dividend. Oh, yeah, sure. Um, so, you know, you'll appreciate this. I was, I was trying as much as possible to be a good communicator and introduce some frameworks and phrases that would stick with people, right? So the drain mm -hmm. pool politics, the zero-sum racial hierarchy. And I was thinking, well, okay, I can't 
you know, articulate the problem in this really sticky, vivid way and then be loose uh, and hand wavy about the solutions and about the world we, we seek. And it came to me as I was really finding more and more that the common denominator of these victories, local victories across the country in, you know, some very surprising places where people could sort of break through zero-sum thinking and and refill the pool of public goods, they were cross-racial coalitions. And -hmm. they were times that people in community said, well, we're going to come together across lines of race and gain some collective power to take on a powerful, usually corporate interest, and we're going to win. And so I thought, well, those wins, those gains are dividends that come from solidarity. Sure. Right. So that was like the, we invest together, and this yeah, is the yeah exactly it works. right. And <laughs> and frankly, you know, obviously, Jen, I wanted this book to be a book that made a strong economic argument mm-hmm. for um, racial equity, and so using terms like dividend was was you know part of that, right? That this is. But you also just, brought the receipts. I mean, people read. You have the evidence too. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, so yeah. So it, it's been really great to see this phrase "solidarity dividend" you know get picked up. And I mean, I was like in Tampa and St. Pete a few months ago, and there was like the Chamber of Commerce. Or not, it wasn't the Chamber of Commerce. It was like a local business, small business group had like mm-hmm. you know created the solidarity dividend committee of you know like the healthcare providers and the you know it was just like. This is great. We want people to start articulating that it's not us versus them, that when we come together and find common solutions to common problems, we can all gain. Because that is really confronting the very long um, story that says that there can be no mutual progress, Mm -hmm. Um, that says that as our country becomes more diverse, it's bad for white people, that says that um, as, uh, you know, if, if... your neighbor's kid gets student loan debt cancellation or your neighbor gets reparations, that's somehow coming out of your pocket and you're going to be worse off, right? This sort of resentment of each other Mm -hmm. that is so much a part of right-wing politics and has cost all of us because then we don't fund the things that we need um, and our economy is, you know, more unequal and more unfair. Um, So that was my hope, was that I could find some way to have a name that would, a phrase that would help us see the path forward. And, I, you know, I love it because you give the examples, you provide the math, and that phrase really works. Um, I guess one of the last things I want to ask about is, you know, for some skeptics out there, you know, there's kind of like, well, um, what about the fact, let's go back to the pool, that there are just racist people. Um, white racists who just have racial animus and they're just going to, whether overtly or covertly, fight every effort toward a true multiracial democracy. And that is why someone like Angela, I don't know if she survives into the the kids book. Yeah. um, Angela, um, who'd spent some time in prison, her story was incredibly moving to me. I don't know people like her, but when you told what it was about her own personal life that turned her in, took her anger and channeled it the way it mm-hmm. did. You gave me a bit of hope. Can you can you speak yeah. about her a bit? So her name is Angela King, and she's a former neo-Nazi white supremacist gang member who went to prison for a hate crime, right? I mean, this is, you know, the worst of the worst, right? The, the like, oh, I'm not a racist, but she was like, no, I'm a racist, you know? <laughs> um, and she had a, a transformation in prison through um, a, a friendship with a Black inmate, and she came out and got educated, right? And she feels very strongly that... Um, her kind of skewed normal American education allowed her to blame people of color, blame Jews, blame everybody else for for everything. And that um, as she got more educated, she became convinced that there was a way for um, people to escape, you know, white supremacist gangs and white supremacist thinking. And so she co-founded an organization called Life After Hate. And, you know, she talks about being bullied and how traumatic that was for her um, and how the decision to become the bully, 
you know, was her response, her self-protecting response. But of course, underneath there was a lot of self-loathing. And I talked to a few former white supremacists in the course of my research, you know, Angela was the one who made it in, but, um, and they all really talked about how much self-loathing they had. Huh. And how coming much. Coming from their childhood or yeah, their families. Yeah, coming or, from, yeah, exactly. Like any of us can have from right. the society. <laughs> right, mean, exactly. Right. But that, you know, what, what the ideology of whiteness and white supremacy does is offer projection as a tool, right? This mm-hmm. is a very... I, I talk about projection in the in the sort of morality and spirituality chapter. It's this idea, it's this this available story, it's this formula that is as old, you know, as racism, which says actually this racialized other is all the things you hate about yourself. Mm. All right, like projecting and so, exactly, that way. and mm-hmm. so the the self loathing becomes external loathing. Yeah, there's oh my gosh, there, there's so much psychology to get into about what makes one vulnerable to racist thinking. What are the insecurities that you know authoritarians use to create racist thinking as a solution to the problems in your life, right? Um, where you can blame others, where you can feel better by putting other people down, right? That's a very um, kind of tried and true phenomenon in our society. And that, you know, it's it, it, what brings me then to one of the very last things, second to last, is the other thing that gave me hope. I mean, you, you just said moments ago that you didn't want to sort of be arm wavy and abstract about solutions. You mentioned a really impressive woman, Dr. Gail Christopher, who happens to be your mother, um, you mentioned. And she has the, these groups that she set up called uh, T-R-H-T, Truth, Racial Healing and Transformation, sort of like the South Africa yep. model, but without the, the reconciliation because mm-hmm. we're not returning. Uh, we're built on this, as you as you mentioned. Those sound so hopeful. Yeah. Uh, but, okay, so the last thing I want to ask you about, I, I'm, I love reading the acknowledgments in people's books. Oh. And I saw that you mentioned a place that you like to go to called Peaches, Shrimp, and Crab. And what is that? Where is it? <laughs> I want to go there. It sounds good. <laughs> it is this amazing black-owned restaurant in my neighborhood that um, I don't know how. It makes no economic <laughs> sense, but it makes no economic sense. But they are open, or they they were when I was writing the book um, at ten a.m. Uh-huh. during the week. Okay, and you know, just like the economics of a restaurant. It's like a, it's a, you know, it's a seafood restaurant. Like it's a dinner restaurant. And usually you have a brunch, but no, this place is open Monday through Friday at 10 a.m. And so it was always like me, the bartender slash waiter, this guy named E and the manager from like 10 to noon or 10 to four, I would just sit at the corner seat at the bar. I would get the staff Wi-Fi. I would have a delicious breakfast. I love having like a huge breakfast. That's my Me meal. Too. You know, yeah. it'd be like grits and eggs and, you know, crab and like just, just great. <laughs> and I would just sit there and I would write. And then, you know, people would come in for the lunch swing and then I would just still be there and I would like <laughs> have maybe a light lunch. Um, and then, you know, I remember E would like say, you know, it's three or four o'clock. Do you want to maybe have a beer? If you, do you need a little stretch? And I'm like, okay, fine, you know. And it was just this great way that I felt like I was treating myself, even though I was doing the hardest thing I'd ever done, which was write this yes. book. Yes, I love it. And who is Peaches? Was that like the founder of the place? No, or? no, I don't know. You know, I actually don't know who Peaches was. Peaches, it's a, it's a, there are three Peaches restaurants in, um, in my neighborhood in in Brooklyn. And so there's Peaches Hot House, Peaches Shrimp and Crab, um, and then there's one other Peaches. But um, I don't know if it's a person, but it works. Okay, I promise you that next time I go to New York, I have to go there. It just feels it's like so it's a magical place. So it's like I really, can write my next book. It's really at delicious. The bar. Okay. <laughs> How are you getting this into the hands of kids where places books are banned? So this is honestly like one of the things people have asked me the most that have read the adult book and are excited about the young adult book. You know, some of them have 
young people in their lives that they want to give it to. But a lot of them are just like, oh, in this moment of these attacks on our children's freedom to learn, you know, how can I get this book to libraries in, you know, rural areas and suburban areas and red states where this is, um, you know, where this is all under attack. And so we're creating a giveaway of free books um, where people can buy a book to go to the fund of books that we will then um, give away to, uh, you, you know, student groups, to librarians and educators and activists who want them, um, who wouldn't otherwise be able to afford them um, or otherwise, you know, are just excited to have the book. And so um, there will be uh, an announcement about that in the coming weeks. I love that. Incredible. Well, it's really been Great talking to you. Now um, now I want to also get the young readers version um, and, and make sure that it's in our, our uh, local library and school. Yes, exactly. As, uh, you know, part of that effort. And also, um, since you had a, you know, a workout, I feel like I should go like work out today because now I'm, <laughs> I'm motivated. You seem so relaxed. It's good. Thanks so much, Jen. Congrats on the podcast. That was so great. It's been too long since Heather and I have spoken, and I am not kidding you. I I just have this idea that uh, Peach's Shrimp and Crab is this kind of mecca, um, and I need to to go there. And when I do, uh, I will report back to you. But in the meanwhile, we will be back next week with another show as we continue to explore the writing process and the nonfiction world together. Please let us know what you think. You can do that by sending an email to Booked Up at politicon.com or if you'd rather take out a pen and paper and write to us at Booked Up P.O. Box 147 Northampton, Massachusetts 01061. To keep up with the show and our featured authors, follow us on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you listen. And please give Booked Up a five-star review. It really will help other people find the podcast. <laughs>